Let me find a couple of texts. Remain standing in Habakkuk chapter 2. And then in the gospel according to John chapter 15. Today and the next week and the next week are very, very important. I want, I want you all to listen to me. We must show the devil who's boss around here on September the 14th. And we got to fill this place up with everyone who loves Lighthouse. If Lighthouse is your church, if you love this ministry, if it's important to you, you must be here. You cannot miss. You got to move some things around. We, this is important as we go forward. On that day, we are launching our 2020 vision, what God wants us to look like in five years. And it's very, very important that you're here. I can't express this enough. Don't throw away your mail. Read your mail. Listen, you can throw away every mail that comes. But if you throw away mail from Lighthouse without reading it, the boogeyman will get you. Amen. There will be sharks in your pool, and it's not going to look good, all right? So please make a special effort to read your mail, read your emails and um, participate, participate on that day, just three short weeks from today. Habakkuk chapter 2, and this is what we'll be doing that day, and it's what we ask you to do. The Lord answered and said, write the vision. Say those three words with me. What are you supposed to do with the vision? And make it plain on tablets that they may run with it who reads it. it the vision sets in motion the activity of God also continue in verse 3 for the vision is for an appointed time but at the end it will speak your vision has a voice and it always tells the truth it will not lie Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. And then some words from Jesus in John chapter 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser or the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So today, watch this. He's either calling you out and putting you on the burn pile or he's pruning you. But you're, you, the God of the garden's hands are upon you. Come on. That's what he's doing. If you're not bearing fruit, out you go. If you are bearing fruit, well, he's going to prune you a little bit, work on you so you can even bear more. Amen. So don't get worried when you feel a little, a little pruning going on. That means you're still bearing some fruit. You already are clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. The only way you will lose out with God is if you cease to abide. You got to hang in there. He who abides in me bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. What can you do without Jesus? Hey, was that pie good, everybody? Had a piece of pie? I think, Chuck, how many did you have? Three or four? Did you see those cute little angelic girls? They insisted on praying for their pie. Wasn't that sweet? Wasn't that precious? The rest of them, Rod, he didn't pray. He just... I mean, but they was praying. He's on to the second piece. Sounds like my Christmas dinner table. Without Jesus, you can do nothing. If anyone abides not in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into fire. They are burned. Let's drop down to verse 15. I do not call you servants. For the servant doesn't know what the master is doing. I've called you friends. For everything I know of the Father, I'm telling you. Watch one more verse. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And I have ordained you that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask of the Father in my name, I will do it for you. Hallelujah. Well, let's give the Lord a great, mighty, awesome shout of praise. This is going to be a great morning in his word. A great morning in his word. Hallelujah. Father God, let's lift our hands. Father God, I thank you today. I thank you today that you are mighty, you are working, and you are doing great things. 
So, Lord, in these moments in your word, I pray that I be a man possessed of an anointing and of a fire, not of this world. I pray, God, that there would be a decision made on every one of this house that we are going to launch into the vision that you've given us. And we will not look back. We will go forward in you in Jesus' name. And everybody say, amen. Amen. Get a piece of paper, pencil. I want to write a couple notes for you today. I'm going to be preaching on this thought. It all starts, it all begins with a vision. It all begins with a vision. And subtitled, you'll never eat the pie until you plant the seed. Mm Mm-hmm. You'll never eat the pie until you plant the seed. I'm excited to tell you, as I mentioned a moment ago, on September the 14th, in just a couple weeks, we are going to be launching in to a 2020 vision. What God has destined and preferred for us as a church and as families and as individuals that he would desire for us to look like in the course of the next five years. And I'm asking you to watch this, to dream big. To dream big and ask God, what is your plan for my life? Take the limits off and just say, Father, if... You are, if we're still around in the next five years, what do you want me to look like? How many of you courageous enough to ask that God that question? And shout, I am. Listen, let me tell you, cowards don't make dreams. Cowards don't set goals. Cowards don't see visions. It takes someone with courage and boldness and faith to hear from God and determine that you are going to do what God has in mind for your life. Hallelujah. I asked you last week to think about the dreams and the visions that have dried, those that have suffered a death, those that you've given up on. And I've asked you to allow Jesus to resurrect those dreams and to resurrect those visions. There was a time you had a vision and a dream you lived for, but it no longer compels you to get up. Now you have moved to a place where you live in day by day and you're not, you're not seeing the preferred future that God has for you. Are you listening to me? Now I want you to hear me tell you this. As I was praying and studying this week about preaching to you today, a prophetic word came into my spirit and I wrote it down. And here's what it is. And God said, I am taking Lighthouse and I'm moving them, I'm shifting them. I'm taking them from a place of maintenance and survival to a place of vision and fulfillment. Could you receive that in your own life? Give the Lord a mighty praise. Come on. A preacher went out to sow the seed. It was the word of God. And a sower went out and he sowed. And the Bible says that some seed never hit and some seed never never, um got deep because the soil wasn't prepared. It landed on thorny ground and rocky soil. But then some, some was planted in the right soil. But what happened was the weeds came up and the cares of life choked out the word of God. I will tell you I've had that predicament and that awful thing has happened to me. It's happened to you and it's happened to us. It's when we no longer feel like we are a candidate for the vision that we once had because life and the circumstances and its contradictions and its confusions and our mistakes and our own shortcomings have just choked out the dream and we're no longer motivated by the goals and the dreams of the future. Acts 2 and 17, on the day of the great outpouring of Pentecost, it was prophesied back in Joel, and Peter quoted and said, this, which, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel, saying that in the last days I will pour my spirit out upon all flesh. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young, your young men will see visions. And so it doesn't matter how old you are. God is interested in your future. And you may be 90, you may be 100, or you may be 13, and somewhere in between, but God has a vision for your life. And you need to shake yourself and shift into gear and get out of maintenance and barely making it by and just kind of living. And you need to say, okay, God, 
I'm ready to get into the attack mode and accomplish what you think I can accomplish. Now, I wouldn't ask you to raise your hand on this question, but the reality is I think all of us probably feel like, man, I'm a little behind where I thought I'd be at this point. I'm not quite, there's some things still out there. There's some dreams, there's some visions. Football coaches call it, I left points on the board. We had 21, but we should have had 28. I left points on the board. I left them on the field. I didn't get them up on the scoreboard. And what happens is we kind of settle in for that, and we say, you know what? I'm not as bad as the next guy. And we start justifying and excusing our lack of zeal. And we need to decide right now, hey, next week, watch this. I'm going to hand you a 2020 workbook. I'm going to put some thoughts in your hands. And look, you don't have to do this. And I know probably not everybody will. I always like 100% participation. But there's always someone who thinks, I'm not going to. I, and I don't get that. I don't understand that. I think that's wrong. I think that's erroneous. I think that's mainly uh, either laziness, rebellion, stubbornness, or whatever. But it's not a good thing to be the only one are the, the top, the 2% that's not participating in the team. This is a team effort. And we need every one of you to engage. Come on. Well, I have never done anything like that before. That's my point. The word says write the vision. So I don't care what you've done before. I don't care if you've ever took a crayon and wrote anything on a construction paper. I want you to write the vision. Speaking of football, football player from a certain college that was very, very good yesterday with gold and blue. I'm not going to mention any names. I'm not that way. But the commentary was saying, Kathy and I heard it, and I wrote it down. He's number 38. I'm going to look a little bit into it. And he, he walked on. He, he played on the team and didn't get a scholarship for several years, and now he's busted into the starting lineup. And the commentary says, when that kid was a young man, he wrote three things on a piece of paper. And one of them was, I want to play football for Notre Dame. And he handed it to his dad. And the commentary said, think of the courage. And this guy turned down scholarships from other universities to go there and, on his own nickel and walk on and finally make the team. But even as a young man, and the guy says, isn't it something to be 20 years old and already, already have something big scratched off your bucket list? I'm talking about somebody with enough courage, enough boldness to say, God, you are a big God. Forgive me for dreaming small. Forgive me for thinking small. I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to rely on you. And what you put in my heart, I'm writing it down, and you and I are going to make it happen. Hallelujah. Woo, nothing can change. Nothing can detour a, change, a charged up, determined child of the living God. Hallelujah. So I don't care how bad you've messed up. I don't care what choked you've got in your life, how the enemy's tried to kill that word. You've got a new day. Hallelujah. And you've got a clean slate. And we're going to all plan a 2020 vision, and we're going to think about what God wants our lives to look like. And I believe in Jesus' name, we're going to see some great things accomplished. Can you shout a great amen? Hallelujah. So the question this morning, is that apple pie that everybody was just, many of you was just eating, how many said, Pastor, I would have come up it was, was a different type of dessert because I like apple pie, but it's not my most favorite. I'd have come up if it was something else. How many raise your hand? What would it take? What would it have taken? What kind of cheesecake? Cheesecake without the graham cracker crust. Got it, got it, got it. What would it take over here? What? Angel food cake? Does that do funny things to your teeth? What about John? Brownie, how many brownie fans? Look, if, if you're real good while I preach, there'll be a day I'll have some cold milk and some more brownies. And I, but it's all contingent on if you want to act like your lighthouse or, or somebody else today. That's all I'm just saying, because you know I don't forget anything. Now watch this. The question is, where did apple pie get a start? Where did apple pie get a start? You know, the idea here is I'm going to give you seven Seven things that I want you to note, and I'm going to start with the apple pie, and I'm going to work backward, and we're going to discover where it got started. Anybody glad you're here today? Now, how many realize that the apple pie, the apple pie is the thing that you say, oh, that's good. That's when you say, mm, okay, that, that's fine. That's, that's what I'm talking about. How many realize that in five years, some of us could be looking at our lives, and we could be looking at our church, and we could say, okay, that's what I'm talking about. That, that, that is 
That is what I was dreaming about. When we just sit there, and I saw Rod just slobbering, and he, and you know when we say something like this, my, 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 that, mm, huh? That's what I was talking about. Mm, 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 mm. That is what I want to call the final product. When you think about your life, there is a product that God wants your life to look like. He wants you to come to a point, we read in the Word this morning, where you are fruit-bearing and where great things are happening in your life. And we want Him to be pleased with us. Don't you want to live the kind of life that God looks at us and, and kind of like Rod looked at that pie and said, Oh, wow. And you know, I talked to Rod throughout the week, and he was as excited about coming to church this morning as he's been in five years. I mean, he was fired up. He could not wait for Sunday. I got out here yesterday. I was at the office praying, and, and it was Saturday. And I looked out, and there's Rod up here in his seat, saving his seat 24 hours in advance. It, let me tell you something. I want God to be excited about my life. I want God to look down and say, hey, everybody, come here. See that? See that? See lighthouse right there? That's what I had in mind. See how they're worshiping? See how they're loving me? See how they're caring about each other? See how they're giving? See how they're concerned and they're praying? That's, I don't know, that's when, I, when Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church, I had that in mind. Listen, some church is going to please Jesus, it might as well be us. That is the pie. That is the final product. The next step I'm going to get from the pie and get all the way to the beginning is the fruit. It is the end result because you are really, really, really close to an apple pie when you got one of these. I mean, you got some work to do, but when you look out at that tree and these beautiful pieces of uh, fruit are growing, you, th you start thinking about, what am I going to do? How, how many pies am I going to make? Am I going to make dumplings? Am I going to can them? Am I going to cut them up? Just, am I going to just eat them? Am I going to put them in the kid's lunch? And there is something awesome about having some fruit in your life. Galatians 5 and 22 says that the fruit of the Spirit is, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. Against such there is no law. Jesus requires of his people to be fruit-bearing people. He requires some, some results. He, listen, he didn't make an investment for just the fun of it. He didn't send his own son, Jesus, to die the cruelest death and the crucifixion on Calvary uh, just because he had nothing better to do. He did it expecting a return on his investment. He wants a result. For the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. He had an end result in mind. And the fruit of our lives is why Jesus came and gave us a new start. Hallelujah. You were not saved just for you. You were not saved so you don't have to go to hell. You were saved to be a fruit-bearing child of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it's time, I never thought I'd say this, particularly in the culture we live in, but I think you'll get me. We get a little bit more fruity around here. Amen. Whew. We got to bear fruit. We got to bear fruit. Say, I got to bear fruit. I want to talk about the leaves for a moment. The leaves are the corresponding actions. Now, let me tell you something about the leaves. They are critical because the fruit comes from the leaves, and the leaves come from things called buds. And when those buds begin to come into the spring, you realize that that fruit tree is going to be a fruit-bearing tree based on the actions you have in your life on that tree. Or are you going to ignore that? I got one apple tree in the yard. I ignore it. And, use, and, and usually I eat one apple while I'm mowing a year. I go through there, and I'm mowing, and they're red, and many are on the ground. And this kind of, how many of you have an apple tree, and you cut up, you, you mow it, and it kind of smells good while you, you know what I'm talking about. And so I'm sitting, there mow, I'm sitting there mowing, and I'll slow down, and I'll find one with not completely ate up with worms. And I'll work around the worms, 
and get maybe one or two bites. That's because I've completely disregarded the tree. Every spring the buds appear, and I don't do anything for them. I don't, I don't take care of them. And let me, let me make this very clear. As a child of God, you have some beginnings in your life. But you can't just get a start and think, I could be left alone now. You can't just have a bud and, and a couple blossoms and think, I've arrived. No, you ain't made pie yet. The truth is, how you treat that bud will determine whether or not you get that vision to come to pass in your life. Whether or not you treat that and you care for it. And let me just make it very, very clear that there are two things happen to people in the church, two things happen to Christians that keeps them from bearing fruit. Number one is what happens to these buds. I won't call them bugs. They get buggy. And so the Bible talks about canker worms and caterpillars and locusts. And if you've ever had a fruit tree, you'll know all about the seven product. And it's, they, there's a powder form. You can put it in a little gun and powder, or you can have this form. And that, guys, you got to go. If you're serious about getting fruit, you got to treat the buds, and you got to treat those small blossoms, and you got to keep the bugs off. You know what happens to some people in a the church? They're too easily bugged. Well, I just don't know. I just, I'm just not sure about that. And, you know, I've never met a person that's critical with just one criticism. Usually, if, if you can get them to open up, and they usually don't mind opening up to the wrong people, I think you might have heard me. But if you finally get them open up, it's like, okay, uh, you, you, need to, you need to make a list, one, two, three, four, five, because, buddy, it's happening. It's like machine gun. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. And 23 pages later, oh, and one more thing. It's called a critical spirit, and it destroys the fruit of the church. And those kinds of people, how many of you know someone that is really, really critical? Raise your hand. Is there love, joy, peace? <laughs> Come on. They ain't got enough joy to blow their nose. Come, they, couldn't, they don't have peace. They're tormented. They're miserable. They're unhappy. Critical people. Let me tell you something about critical people. They are the lowest form of life because it takes no uh, intelligence. It takes no spirituality to be critical. The easiest thing to do is to be critical, to just sit back and judge and say, you know, I'm, I wouldn't do it that way. You know, you got these overweight guys are so excited about football season. They're going to sit there eating pretzels and popcorn and, and brats and all this stuff, and they're, they're, they're going to tell these, these athletes, well, you shouldn't do that. That's called armchair quarterback. And we just make this very clear. In the kingdom of God, we ain't got time for any of that. You don't quit getting buggy. Come on now. And deal with it and just quit letting things bother you. Just, just understand we're all here doing our best. And it's not your job to, uh, to be the judge and jury over people. I like Jesus when he said, quit trying to walk around with the tweezers, get a little splinter out of their eye. You got a big old telephone pole stuck in yours. You can deal with your own issues. Quit getting uh, so buggerfied. Is that good preaching? And the other thing that will keep this tree from blossoming and bearing fruit, not only is bugs, but the other arch rival is frost. <laughs> Matthew 12 and 24 says, in the last days, there's going to be a lot of frost. Because in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. And we need to get back on fire for Jesus where we burn hot. Well, we ain't got time. We just don't have time for any of that stuff of being cold. Come on, somebody. Amen. We need to get on fire for the Lord and just say, I'm going to burn bright for him. One little spark sets the whole thing ablaze. Hallelujah. 
Woo. You know, you have these ice trucks, and these guys get gloves, and they deliver bags of ice, and they go down the road. Have you ever seen anybody pull up and take, get out with their phone, and they're taking pictures of that guy putting ice in the thing? Well, you go to a fire, and there's a whole block of people following that fire truck. And you get people standing around, tra traffic stops, and they're taking pictures, and they're calling everybody. You won't believe the fire that I'm seeing here. Nobody's interested in an ice truck, but everybody's interested in a fire truck because a fire is something that is powerful. And I want to be a church. Let me tell you something. There is a church in Indiana a couple hours from here that over the past couple years has had the fire trucks called out on them twice. People have driven by... And they, they've called 911 saying that church is on fire. And literally, they are, visit, they are seeing the visitation of the fire of Pentecost sit on that church. Come on, somebody. We got time for all this cold stuff. We got time to hand God a cold shoulder. Hallelujah. I mean, when God goes in to hug you, hug him back. When God goes in to kiss him, kiss him back. Quit being cold with God. Come on. You're as cold as ice. Come on now. We need to get fired up. Hallelujah. Woo. Someone jump to your feet right now and declare you're going to be on fire. This is a church on fire. Oh, I think we got a more fire of praise than that. Come on, this is a church on fire. Give the Lord. The next one, how we get that, how we get there is we start with some branches. And the branches are your priorities. And when you are in the hands of the gardener, you will understand what it's like to be pruned. I have in my hand, all you gardeners know these are pruners. And the careful gardener, he will look and he will realize that that's way too thick in there. Some of us get too thick in our priorities. Everything can't be important. You're going to have to find out the top two or three things in your life and sell out to them. Quit acting like everything in the whole world is as important as everything else, because it's not. There are so many of us get so tangled up in the thick things of temporary living, and we, we panic and we get upset and we get worried because because. All of these trivial matters have thickened us up. And if we're not careful and we don't let the gardener prune us, we won't bear fruit. So the gardener comes in. He says, you know, that's got to go. That's got to go. And he begins to very carefully do some pruning. And things are cut away. And no one likes that feeling. But some of you need to decide what's important in your life. What is priorities? And you need to let the gardener prune all that mess and all that junk that is keeping you from being productive. Do you want the pie? Come on. We finally got a piece of the pie. Hi, hi. Come on. I said, do you want the pie? Do you want to look at your life in five years and think, man, I'm telling you, I never dreamed it'd be this good, but it's that good. Because when it came down to pruning, I let him prune me. I dealt with the bugs, I dealt with the frost, and all of a sudden, boom, I got all this fruit. Kapow! Woo! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Now, what do you think God's interested in? That, 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 that tree that can drop one little or two yellow apples, or that tree that produces bushels and bushels and bushels? Come on. Anybody glad you're at Lighthouse today on a Labor Day weekend? This is called the trunk. The trunk is the most solid part of the tree, and it is, it is the planning stage. Let me tell you what Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4 says. It says that every enterprise 
happens when this house is built and it is established in understanding. And I love the rendering of the uh, Living Bible, and it says, through sound planning, this house is built. When you and I understand that God orders our plans and our lives are all wrapped up in what he has planned for us, we understand that we can be very, very, very hard to move. Come on, somebody. I want you to write this down. I must develop a plan. I must develop a plan for growth and improvement. When we give you the 2020 vision, it's not just going to be some things that, well, we'd like to see happen. God not also has only given us the vision, but he's given us strategies and plans and if in the next five years we follow the plans, we will eat the pie. Come on, somebody. And there's no one that has ever gotten any level of success or victory accidentally. It comes through hard work. It comes through planning. It comes through discipline. It comes through dedication. And you need to set in your mind how your plan is going to be set in motion. When that trunk has grown and mature, you just not moving it. How many have ever uh, been in a car and you ran into a tree? I had that last year. I was plowing snow, and I slipped off, and I, I, I was so proud. Of my, my It wasn't brand new, but it was new to me, my shiny, beautiful truck. And, man, I messed that thing up. I tore it all up. I knocked the mirror. I broke in the window, the glass, the door. And... And I finally got out of there, and I was just crying. Oh my, 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 my truck! I was so proud of my truck, and there it is, all beat up. And I thought, what in the world was that tree gonna look like? And that tree didn't move. It barely had a scrape. I mean, I went over there and I kicked it, and I was mad. I bruised it up a little bit. I thought my truck can't look like that, and you look like that. When you run into a trunk, the trunk wins. And the reason some of you are, are so easily moved is you're not getting your trunk big enough. Come on now. I know they won't tell you that at the gym, but football players need a big trunk. You, your trunk is your middle area. It's, you can't be, you, you know, you, well, I'm not going to get in that, but you can't look like a basketball player and be real good on the line of football. And the thing about me is no one ever confused me for a basketball player or a 100-yard dash guy. There I said, oh, you're a lineman, aren't you? You look at the trunk on that guy. My goodness. Here's the point this morning. We got we to make some plans. You, you know, you can be maintenance mode, and you can look just like you did in five years. Probably you'll get worse. But if you don't get some plans going on in your life, you will never see greatness. And I'm ready to see greatness around your life. Can you shout amen? And then you need to realize that underneath the soil, about a time, usually sometimes at least one and a half size of the tree above, there's a root system that goes way down beneath. And the bigger the root system is, the bigger the tree and the trunk is. Here's the deal. Your root system are your goals. you got to make some plans, and you got to set some goals. <clears throat> I said a moment ago, cowards don't set goals because the devil tells them, oh, you're never going to achieve them. You're never going to make them. You'll, you'll never. It would be like playing basketball and say, I'm quitting because not every time I shoot, I'm going to make one. So I'm not even going to try. Oh, that's real courageous. I would rather set goals and miss a couple and make a couple than to set no goals and get 100%. Listen to me. Are you willing? Are you willing to set some goals about your life. I want to start all over. Because some of you are, you're killing the brownie plan for everybody. Because I told you I'd give you brownies and some cold milk if you acted good. And, and there's three amens I'm getting. So you, how quickly have you forgotten? But I haven't forgotten. So I'm going to start all over. How many realize you need to really set some goals in your life? Why can't they amen like that all the time? I don't know. They're your people. But the roots, let me tell you something about the roots. When the roots, when there is a drought and, there, and there's no rain, you know what those roots do? They start going crazy. 
They start digging. They'll bust into sewer pipes. Come on. They'll look, they'll, you've had that happen. They'll get in septics. They'll go down in the water. They keep digging and digging and digging. They're going to find them some water. If there's no water coming from above, they're going to find somebody. The root is the most powerful part of what's going to happen in your life. You've got to make some plans. Ordinary people won't do this. Average people won't do this. Regular churches won't do this. Regular companies and marriages won't do this. Well, my marriage isn't going well like it should. Have you made plans? If you don't plan to get better, you plan to get worse. Hallelujah. So let me back up and tell you what we have done this morning. We started out with the pie. Mm -hmm. We went from the pie which is the final product to the fruit, which is the end result from the leaves, which is the corresponding actions, from the branches, which is the priorities, from the trunk, which is the planning stage, from the root, which are the goals we set, but that's not where the pie began. Listen to me. I'm going to put in my hand exactly the beginning of that pie. That pie began... With that little bitty, bitty, bitty seed you see right there. That is an, a seed from the apple I had for breakfast. It is the smallest part of all that we have just talked about, but it is where the pie gets its beginning. And what is the seed? The seed is the vision. Before you ever have fruit to pick, before you ever have pie to eat, there has to be a vision. The vision is where it all begins, and the vision is the seed. You and your life began with a seed. Come on now. Every living thing has begun. Its origin it comes from the seed. And the Bible talks so much about the seed, sowing the seed, seed time and harvest. <coughs> mm. I, wouldn't get, I wouldn't need a drink when I got empty hands. I got to have everything. In my hand, I have the beginnings of a tomato. I have the beginnings of green beans. I have the beginnings of peace. I have the beginning. My dad always said, I can't, I got to, honey. I have to. I'm sorry. I have to. I have to. Can I? You insist? My dad always said, eat every bean and pee on your plate. Some of you aren't going to get it. Yeah, you won't go. You're not going to get it. So I didn't know if I was to eat every bean and pee on my plate or eat every bean and pee on my plate. I didn't know. I have the beginnings of corn. Come on. How many love you some sweet corn with a little salt and butter? Come on. You act like Rod with, pumpkin, with, with apple pie. I know you do. And you pull up to your plate and you've got a whole stack of, of eating ears off. Eating ears off. Yes. Everything begins with the seed. How are you going to think that you're ever going to get fruit and be sweet and make something that's going to please God without a vision? The vision is where it all begins. You've, you saw, Johnny Appleseed had a vision. He didn't have no pie. He didn't have, he didn't have any... Uh, of that stuff, you know, he just had seeds and began to sow the seeds. And when and when you sow the seed, you set in motion the reality that someday it will come to pass. Write the vision down, make it plain, that those who read it may run with it. Though the vision tarry, it has an appointment to it. The vision is the seed, and it has it has a couple things in it. The seed has the DNA of the life of that fruit in it. 
and it also has a seasonal timetable in it. It will be set in motion, but you've got to plant the seed. And you know why some people just wonder, well, where's my harvest? Because the seed's still in the bag. It's up on the shelf someplace. I went and I paid, you know, I'm telling you, I made an investment yesterday. I went and bought a uh, $1.59 for tomato seeds, and I don't have any tomatoes. Where what do you do with the seeds? Well, they're still in the bag on the shelf. And, and, and you know what some people like that do? They just get jealous of everyone walking around eating tomatoes. Oh, look at you with your big tomatoes. <laughs> I'm going to hurry on. Look at <laughs> Look at you with the corn. Look at you with the harvest. Just, I can't believe all the harvest they got. Well, yeah, because their seed got out of the bag and got out of the shelves. And their seed got put in the ground. Here's what, anybody glad you're here today? Oh, let me just tell you a couple things before we, before we pray. And today, Kathy and I are going to pray over miracles for you because some of you desperately need a breakthrough type of season to start happening in your life. I know I know that if the next five years for us looks like the last five years, that's not okay. That's not good enough for God. Uh -uh, no. And so we've got to set some things in motion. So here is what require, is required for seed. Number one, for seed to work, you've got to plant it. You've got to plant it. John 12 and 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, most assuredly, I say unto you, the sepulchre corner of wheat, um, die and fall to the ground, it abides alone. But if it die, it bears much fruit. you got to get that seed deep in the ground. you got to plant it. You can't be afraid to let it leave your hand. And I've seen it at offering times. You've seen it at offering times. There they sit. Hold on to my seed. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. I can't let go of my seed. It's got to, you know what? Then all it's ever going to be is seed in your hand. You can't get the pie if you don't plant the seed. Shout that with me. You can't eat the pie if you don't plant the seed. Hallelujah. And unless that seed gets put in the ground, it will profit you. It will bear no fruit. You can't be afraid to get rid of the seed. Now watch this. The seed will leave my hand. I don't have it in my hand anymore. But God will see to it. It will never leave my life. Whew. Seed may leave your hand. It will never leave your life. It's there. It's right there. And it's doing what it was sent to do. Inside one oak, acorn lies a thousand oak trees. It, it's in, the DNA is in the seed. As soon as that seed was planted in, in fertile soil, it begins, it begins this process of germination. The other thing that happened, you've got to water it. You've got to water the seed. And the word of God is how you water the seed. The word of God is the water. You've got to get the word in you every day, over and over again. And let me tell you something. People who don't have the harvest, stop watering the seed. You've got to be able to have that word flowing into your life. That it, according to Ephesians 5 and 26, that the water and the word will sanctify you. And there will be a washing, there will be a cleansing, and there will be the there's wonderful power, the mightiest thing in the world in nature is water. You got to water your seed. And then the seed works thirdly. As long as you don't dig it up. Come on. And you know what that means? You can't get discouraged. I know some of us got the hoe out more than once and just said, forget it. It ain't working. I'm hardly seeing anything happen. Am I talking to anybody real good? Oh, it's not happening. You know, pastor asked me to write this vision down, try to make some plans, try to make some goals. And, you know, well, forget it. And we just go, we just go out there and we just kick our feet and we just stomp around and we just run over it and we dig it up. And then come harvest time, other people out there with their head on the right combine and they're combining their harvest. And we're looking and say, what happened to mine? Well, you dug it up. When you have a wrong attitude, you dig up your seed. 
When you have the wrong spirit, you dig up your seed. You can't dig up your seed. 1 Corinthians 15, 8 says, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Psalm 92 and 12. The righteous shall flourish in the, in the house of our God. Those that are in the house of God, there is something that's going to be happening that's going to be strong and mighty and great. We've got to be fruit bearers. Hallelujah. Anybody been glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Come on, give the Lord a mighty shout. Give the Lord a mighty shout. I want you to listen to me very closely. Will you take, will you take to heart what I just said? When will you set in motion with obedience and with compliance? And will you undertake the assignment of your 2020 vision with a very serious approach and you will do what we have laid out as the pastor of this church and you'll cooperate and you begin in fact let me just ask this how many have already been thinking about your 2020 vision where are you all right okay next week it has to be a hundred percent of us you can't wait you can't wait till midnight 2019 think oh by the way on 1231 midnight 2019 oh yeah I need a 2020 vision it's not happening we're setting you five years in advance to dream big I'll throw one out there let me just throw one out there if you have a child that's um You know, teens, somewhere in there. It would be my vision. Watch this. That maybe in five years, God has put the right one in their lives. Wouldn't that be nice? Just start thinking about what you'd like life to look like. And that you envision them walking down the aisle in purity and you envision them serving God without drinks and alcohol and drugs no jail visitations well God just I'm just going to assume so no no quit assuming write it down you don't eat the pie unless you plant the seed, and the seed is the vision. For all of us, all of you who may not have a child that's serving the Lord, I could tell you what I would do. That'd be the top of my list. They're serving Jesus. In five years, at least in five years. It could hopefully sooner. Write it down. Say, I will write it down. Today we're going to do a couple things. When you leave, don't get in a hurry to leave. I haven't left you all out. I have got a fresh, beautiful, delicious apple for every one of you to take home. You're too kind. Don't, don't hold it, pause. No, no. That's why. Hey, you know, that's fine. I'm really not sure the brownies are coming, honestly. <laughs> I'm not so sure they're coming. We'll give you another chance next week. All right? But how many are here today as you stand with me across this place? Can I just be honest with you about a couple things? I'm just going to tell you the truth. Um, and this is not any indictment on you at all, honestly. This is not, please hear, hear me out. 
in the spiritual world, a few weeks ago when I preached on finances, tithing and giving, and the blessed life, I was more free to preach about money than I am being free to preach about vision. This is a spiritual warfare. Some of you don't understand. This is a deep, very, very deep thing because there's nothing more the devil wants than to just keep you where you're at. And you would think it's really challenging to preach on finances. Man, I had freedom, I had liberty. But there is this war that is going on that the devil knows, okay, I let him build the church, but I'm not going to let him fill it and pay for it. First of all, devil, you didn't let us do anything. You, 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 I don't need your permission to do anything around here. And secondly, just as you didn't stop us from building this, you're not going to stop us from filling it, and you're not going to stop us from paying for it. It's not going to happen. You, you, you're a loser three times. Now, I'm going I'm to tell you all something. For those of you who do nothing with this word, for those of you who do nothing with this word, and I hope, I hope that concludes nobody, your life will re absolutely remain the same, and then it will start in decline. You stay in neutral long enough, you'll be backing up. <coughs> the devil is fighting this with everything he can because he knows the power of that vision is all wrapped up in the seed. And when you plant it in the ground and you set it in motion, he cannot prevent you from someday enjoying a nice piece of pie. I'm telling you, we have to do some serious, serious spiritual warfare. How many of you say, Pastor, I sense what you're talking about, that when it comes to me and my vision and my future, I know I'm under attack when I begin to think about those things. Would you raise your hand? Come on. Let me see him. Let me see him. Let me see him. Throw him up there. Throw him up there. Come on. And you know what he tells you? Oh, shut up, big shy. It ain't going to happen. Don't be writing that down. There's no way that's going to happen. There's just no way. You know, you're not, that ain't going to happen. And we need to prove the devil a liar. And look, don't be afraid to fail. Write down the vision and let God be God. I'll guarantee you one thing. You write down some things, some of those are going to come to pass. I can't promise you they all will, but I promise you there's going to be a lot more victory if you don't try. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You know, I'm sitting here thinking, um, in our 34 years of marriage, I've heard my husband preach well over 2,000 times. I can tell you, that what he preached this morning is probably the best message I've ever heard him preach. It is the most practical. It's the most applicable. And that's why there's a fight. You know, we sing songs like nothing's impossible for God. Will you prove that to me? Because most of the time we will never stick our neck out to prove that nothing's impossible for God. God can do exceedingly abundantly above all we would ever think or ask. We can say that easily because we never put a line. We never put pen and paper to see, will God really do? And God is saying to us as individuals and to us as a church, you write it down. You try it. Let me show you what I'm going to do. I can promise you in 2020, my life is going to look nothing like it looks like right now because I have a determination. It has nothing to do with being Kathy Holderman. It has to do with putting what we just heard into place, causing it to happen, May, writing it down, expecting it, looking forward to it, taking, walking through those steps. That's an awesome, awesome word this morning. I, I know that he wants to give an altar call and he's gonna, but I want to precede that with this thought. Last Sunday, the Lord spoke something to me and I kept it. And I shouldn't have, and that's disobedience, and I ask your forgiveness, and 
I ask the Father to forgive me. But this morning it's here again, and I'm not going to hold it. The Lord is saying to me that there are people who are sick who don't even know they're sick. Last week we laid hands on the sick and expect God to be healing. I have two sister-in-laws. One of them is Janet. You know her and you've heard her story. She's laying now dying of cancer. And without the undertaking of God, she'll be in heaven someday soon. I have a second sister-in-law. Her name's Adele. She worked probably 40 plus hours this week. She has the money she needs to do what she wants to do with it. She could has friends, relationship, all of those sorts of things. But can I tell you who's sick and doesn't know it? Adele. She doesn't know Jesus. If she dies, she's going to spend eternity in hell. Now, if you walk in the hospital room today, one of them is going to be laying in a bed, and the other is going to be sitting, trying to comfort one. And that's all mixed up. Because although Janet's body is weak and her physical man is dying, there's a spirit that's alive and well in her. And she's been praying in the Holy Ghost this week and, and all of that. And, and temporal things, she might leave planet Earth, but she's never going to die. Death is separation from God. Who's dying is a sister who worked 40 hours this week. Some of us are sitting here today, and physically, our bodies are fine. But we have allowed sin, criticism, doubt, fear. We allow those things to creep in. And this morning, our physical body might be okay, but our spiritual man is not well today. Our spiritual man is weak. Depression starting to step in. And the challenge this morning is, if you're physically ill, we want to pray for you. But if there's another area of your life that is not 100%, if you don't even know, how could I even see a vision? I am so clouded over, I don't even have an ounce of hope to see a vision. Then you need prayed for today as well. Thank you, honey. Thank you for being obedient. Let's lift our hands. Father, we come to worship you. We come to just to be in your presence. If you are here today and you're not as close to Jesus as you know you should be, would you walk this altar as fast as you can? You're just not as close to him as you know you ought to be. Don't look around, please come. You're not as close as you once were, please come. You need more of him.